Control. Talk now. Your Smart Buildings video cast and podcast. Here we go. This is episode 368 for the week ending June 21st. It's Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day! My name's Fritz Stromquist, this is my sister Evelyn Stromquist, and this is my little brother Axel Stromquist. We decided to give my dad and Ken Smyers the week off. We want to say a special thanks to this week's show's sponsor, Siemens Building Controls. Speaking of Siemens Building Controls, my dad and Ken did a great interview earlier this week, so sit back and enjoy. <laughs> but I'm pleased to report the recorder is recording. So with that, Kenny Smyers, how about introducing our first guest? Okay, I'd love to. We have Mahesh Nair. He's the Butterfly Valve Product Manager for Siemens. Welcome to the show, Mahesh. Welcome, Mahesh. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, man, we're so glad to have you here, man. You know, Siemens has got so many really great people that, that work with their organization. And uh, tell us about you. How did you get in the controls industry, and how did you wind up at Siemens? Sure. So I've been with Siemens for close to two years now. And prior to that, I was a R&D engineer at uh, Bell & Gossett. So I came from the pumps world and uh, I came from the manual balancing valves world. And uh, the last two years I've been in the control industry. And uh, I, at, at, when I first started out, uh, Eric, I did not know about what does a normally closed valve mean? What is normally open valve mean? What is modulating? What is floating? I have no clue. And I've actually seen a lot of your videos to help me understand like what all this means. So thanks. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Well, <laughs> welcome to our industry, man. We are so glad to have you here. And of course, what a great background to get into uh, valves because as you know, pumps is all about pressure and, and understanding how water or liquid get through pipes. So it's really good stuff. Sure. But did, you, did you see the... Uh, the video that Ken did about normally open, normally closed. It, I think it was our best video. Now we might've got to take it down because it was politically incorrect, but uh, Kenny was at a bar, but I think it was Roger Rebenack and, and he was explaining normally open, normally closed. And normally open is you take the beer and your mouth is always open. So you can just pour beer in it. Right. <laughs> and it just never stops. It's a constant flow. And normally <laughs> closed is your mouth is closed and the beer goes all over your face. So. <laughs> no, and, and, I mean, hey, you got to throw your spring return in there too. So did you have your fail safe? And uh, yeah. yeah, well, well, spring spring return is no matter how hard you stop trying to drink the beer, your mouth keeps getting open again. Kenny, you're very familiar with that's called spring return turn normally open for our, <laughs> our newbies in All there. Right. And uh, well, you're know, getting back to the, the, the butterfly valve. You, know, you know, Mahesh, uh, you know, Eric, uh, and I have been in the business thirty years uh, at Plus, and and uh, and we've watched the. Uh, the growth of butterfly valves, the evolution, so to speak, of butterfly valves. When they first came out, you know, there was a lot, lot of, you know, people were hemming and hawing about, you know, were they better than globe valves or whatever. And then they made a surge. But right now, butterfly valves are really part of the, the modern smart building infrastructure. Tell us about uh, about Siemens's new products. Well, no, hang on, hang on real quick, Kenny. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to remember we were going to set it up. So just do exactly what you did and say, say, say tell us about Siemens' new product. Just say... Tell us why people are using butterfly valves. What, why would somebody use a butterfly valve? You set it up nice, but why are people using butterfly valves now? Okay, in, in comparison to globe valves? Uh, well, just in comparison to any valve. But okay, just, is that a good uh, idea, just, Mahesh? Is that, is that a good idea? No, we talked about that. It'll set it up, then he can explain why people would even think about butterfly valves. Then we dove right to uptail right into, tell us about Siemens offering. Sounds good. So Mahesh, uh, the butterfly valves have come a long way. Uh, basically evolved, I'd say, but uh, why, why would... Uh, building owners and, and facility managers and contractors use butterfly valves. So butterfly valves is, as you mentioned, it's gaining a lot of popularity in the industry and it's being used in a lot of applications. Um, and it's, it's a great isolation valve. So it provides bubble tight shutoff uh, for up to like 175 PSI uh, for full cut versions. And it's greater than even the ANSI class four uh, leakage standards. Uh, so it's purely, it's bubble tight shutoff. So that's one advantage. And 
a lot of butterfly valves are being used in uh, air, ha air handling units, uh, cooling tower applications, chillers, boilers. And also uh, there's this new trend that's uh, getting popular. It's uh, district heating uh, for, so for large campuses. Uh, you have one central heating source and then it provides uh, heat for a large number of buildings. So butterfly valves are great for that application. So it's, it's uh, getting really popular. And uh, one of the main advantages of butterfly valves is uh, its large size ratio, size to uh, volume and weight ratio. So you can go up sizes um, without gaining too much in weight. Uh, so the piping weight, whereas if you uh, I mean, globe valves and ball valves, they cut off typically at six inches, but butterfly valves, you can go up to like 24 inch. That's what Siemens offers, but it, we go up to like 30, 35, uh, 36. And I've, I've seen like valves that's like 54 inches wow. uh, in image pictures. So it's big, it's like two people on top of each other. So it, you can get pretty huge with butterfly valves uh, that you can't do with a ball valve or a globe valve. And, <laughs> and uh, the relative... Um, weight that you add to the piping it's lesser compared to a, a ball or a globe valve right well, well not only the relative weight there but the relative weight you add to your wallet because if, for our audience out there if your distributor ever tries to sell you a, a six or an eight or a 10 inch globe valve you need another distributor because it, true right the relative cost is a lot less than right, your typical exactly. control valves. right and uh, you know it's it's great for isolation purposes i mean there's nothing that beats a butterfly valve for isolation purposes uh, for modulating purposes, when you have to control the flow, uh, what you have to take care of is that a butterfly valve has a it's an equal percentage curve. So a butterfly valve is good for isolate uh, for controlling the flow when it's uh, probably like 50 to 70 percent open. So you need to be careful about that. Uh, but otherwise, it's a great product. It's a right. it's, it it uh, it can match the ball and globe. And, and really oh, go ahead, Kenny. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I, I just, uh, again, I, I was just trying to emphasize that how the quality and the engineering and, the, and the, the materials that you use have improved over the years to, to create that controllability, to create the shutoffs, you know, and, and Siemens uh, has really come up with a very well engineered butterfly valve to, that you, you guys are excited about. And um, the applications that Eric's talking about, there's no question about it. Butterfly valves, if they're put in correctly, uh, save a great deal of material cost and, and size wise. So it's, uh, I became a very big fan of butterfly valves, you know, especially over four inches uh, because it became reliable and, and shut off and, uh, you know, it was all there. So, yeah. And, and of course, Kenny, the thing that Siemens has is they have it all anyway, right? So you guys have got the the bulk valves, you got the glow valves, and now you got the butterfly valves. So, uh, so, but, but I know the thing about Siemens, Mahesh, is that you guys don't do anything halfway. So tell us about this this version of the butterfly valves what makes them different and why do you guys add them to the portfolio yeah absolutely so what we did was uh, over the last few years we reached out to our customers and understood their pain points um, one thing we wanted to do or did not want to do was uh, just have a me too product because there's a lot of competitors out there in the butterfly market industry and so we not want to create just another Me Too product. We wanted to go above and beyond to help our customers. And what we saw was our, uh, our, or the feedback that our customers gave us was uh, they were having issues at high temperature. Uh, they were having material uh, you know, issues with the construction materials that's used in the butterfly valves, which was leaking. And uh, lastly, they were having a lot of issues with uh, delivery, ish uh, delivery lead times and uh, technical support issues. So we wanted to create a product that addressed all these concerns. Um, and I think we have a truly robust solution that uh, that's optimized for any applications out there with our new butterfly valves. Another thing about butterfly valves, especially these uh, new robust butterfly valves that uh, Siemens is coming out with, is they last long. Their durability is incredible now. I, I saw some oh, of the yeah. specs that you all had advertised in your marketing brochure. Uh, and it's very impressive how many uh, cycles uh, you know, I think he's had a hundred years uh, on one of the brochures on the video. Uh, so, actually yeah. had... we've, we've done a ton of testing and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I was, uh, I was shocked like at how much uh, we were, uh, you know, our engineers were uh, testing these butterfly valves, but we really wanted to create a solution that wouldn't fail on the customer and was uh, ready for any application out there in the market. So just to give you an idea of like what testing we do, um, we for the for the valve and assembly we test them 
uh, for 30,000 full strokes and 300,000 repositions. And then we test our industrial actuators for 1.2 million repositions. And we test our damper actuators for 1.5 million repositions. So what all this means is that um, it's, it's all numbers, but what it all means is that it's, uh, we do like, years worth of testing in our lab um, at, and all these testing was done at a continuous 250 degree temperature and also at minus negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we, we tested the both the worst ends of uh, the application uh, that's typically found in the market and uh, our, our valves came out without a scratch on them. So we, we wanted to create a good uh, high quality product and uh, we, uh, and that's the reason why we did all this testing. Well, that's very important. I, I know that uh, the folks we work with, that's, that's the important aspect. There's a decision where price doesn't always uh, prevail because they need to put something in there that's going to last five years. Now, the expected warranty for a lot of the stuff is, is five years. There's a, been a precedent set in the industry so that the, the, the materials you put in, they've got to have uh, you know, the ability to do all those, those cycles. Yeah, it's very impressive. In fact, I wanted to compliment uh, Gloria Lauriet, uh, your marketing yeah. manager for field devices, because... Uh, that package that you guys just recently released with the YouTube videos and, and then you've got a webinar coming up. Uh, it, it really is like an educational process because uh, I think a lot of people gloss over the details and understand what that means with those temperature ratings you just gave and the amount of cycles. So tell us a little bit about uh, your marketing efforts to get the message out about Siemens's new valves. So, yeah. So our marketing team, uh, we have a new team and, uh, they are all like dynamic personality, like uh, very, very competent people. And uh, they have been doing a lot of good stuff. So we are creating a, a series of webinars to train the industry on uh, what we offer and what's our value and how our uh, butterfly valves truly offer great value and uh, how more is created by butterfly valves. Uh, and then our marketing uh, people, they uh, created a new website, a uh, totally brand new website, uh, and where they have put in a lot of our brochures, where you can find uh, the technical documentation. Uh, we have our cross-reference over there. Uh, so a lot of ton of information is there in our new website. And plus, uh, they, they spearheaded this effort of creating an online uh, sizing and selection tool. It's called HIT, and it's up there in the, on our website. Uh, HIT stands for HVAC Integrated Tool. And uh, now we offer um, the general public, um, the industry, the offer of sizing and selecting uh, the right butterfly valve based on your application needs. So that's one thing, uh, that's one gap where we, that we found out during our uh, voice of customer interviews where they did not uh, size and select the valve correctly and we have a solution for that also. Thanks to well, to your point, you know, you say that uh, the pain points were high temperature, you know, the ability to sustain high temperature, leaking, and then delivery issues. But another big problem with butterfly valves was the specification. You had a group, of, you know, it was like, you know, you had to draw arrows across, you know, because you couldn't pick the right butterfly valve uh, combination, you know, where you had to submit it for, you know, official review and submittal approval by the engineers. So I hope... I got a good feeling you guys have resolved that. that yeah. that's, yes. <laughs> I, I, th I, think, I think so. You guys do such a great job with your marketing team. And, and you know, I, I, like Kenny says, you know, the devil's in the detail and, and the fact that you guys have all this. But look, I want to take a little different tack for maybe our podcast listeners who are not able to sort of see this. But for our podcast listeners, if you look behind Kenny and, you know, Mahesh, I'll tell you, right over his right shoulder, that building back there, let's just pretend like that's one of Kenny's buildings and you're the facility manager at Kenny's building, right? And you need to do a butterfly valve upgrade. It's a, it's a backwards way of asking, what questions should owners uh, or facility managers or even integrators be asking about the butterfly valves? In other words, Kenny walks in and he's got a butterfly valve. What questions are you asking? What's the, what's the real information you need to know to make a good decision? So, I mean, I would say, first of all, you need to know uh, if the butterfly valve is used for isolation or for modulating. That's one thing. Okay. Um, and then, um, so, so if you, um, and then if, uh, you need to know like, what's the temperature of the, uh, fluid in the medium, you know, uh, that is, well, I mean, basically what application is it used for if it's a cooling tower versus a, a boiler. So that kind of thing. And then um, the other thing is you need to know like what, what size uh, is the butterfly valves. Uh, 
and what size do you want? So for example, um, for modulating applications, even if the pipe size is eight inch, you can go down like one or two sizes and, uh, to get a good controllable T uh, and a good control uh, controlling range of the butterfly valves. So that's something that you need to know. And uh, well, let me let me hop, let me hop in real quick on that and, and ask you a question because you know Kenny and I both know over the years and as you do as well that we knew doing globe valves and and um, uh, you know even ball valves. You know, there's not a lot of wiggle room. You sort of, if you don't get the the flow right, understanding the C sub B and the flow right and size it right, you can have you can have issues, if, especially if you oversize it, right? If you undersize it, you're not getting enough flow. If you oversize it, you're you're hunting all the time. Vis a vis or compared to uh, you know globe valves and or ball valves, is there more or less wiggle room with the butterfly valves for modulation application? you have to do more on it or do you have a little bit more flexibility in terms of your size? So uh, for modulating applications, um, like I mentioned, we have to be within that, uh, I would say like 50 to 70% open. Uh, that's where you get most of your controllability range. And uh, the way we have set up our uh, hit tool uh, our online selection tool. Um, if you have a uh, modulating application, the C sub V is uh, corresponding to 60% uh, open uh, uh, configuration. Okay. So that, that kind of helps you. Um, but uh, for sizes, uh, I, I would say like for sizes, uh, half inch through two inch uh, butterfly valves are not available. Um, so you would go with ball or globe. But, gotcha. uh, but for two inches through six inches, uh, I would say like uh, a butterfly valve that's 60% uh, open can be uh, compared to a ball or a globe. And uh, so it, it offers similar characteristics and uh, similar responses. Well, now, now for me, what I'm hearing there, and, you know, typically what wigs a lot of people out typically with like the globe or the ball valves is typically like say, if you got a two inch pipe on, you might have, you know, the, the flow might dictate an inch and a half valve, which is smaller. But if you, what I hear you saying vis-a-vis -vis the modulation of the butterfly valves, that if you're 60 to 70% of the flow is where you need to be, you're probably going down a size at least, right? I would guess. So if you got a, an eight inch pipe, you're probably like a six inch butterfly valve typically. Right. Yeah. I think uh, that's, that's uh, you can either line size or you can go down a line size. And I think that's what, uh, from all the specs that I've seen, uh, the flow rates, all the applications where I've sized the valve, it, you always get better control if you go, uh, one line size below and right. uh, leave the butterfly valve at 60% open. Yep. Got you. Now, the other thing, that, the, the bad rep you hear on butterfly valves a lot, or at least in the past you hear, is that, well, they leak. But you guys, we've got a special liner, right? And and what's your leakage rate? And I mean, to, to, to the person in Kenny's building that says, I'd like to use butterfly valves, but I hear they leak. What do you say? So, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. So we have actually made a lot of enhancements because uh, product leaking is was one of the issues that our customers um, pointed out uh, based on what uh, the current problems they had faced. And what we did was we changed the liner. So typically uh, uh, a liner is a Buna or EPDM. So those are the rubber polymers that's used. And uh, for EPDM, we Typically, the comp I mean, the manufacturers they make a sulfur cured EPDM, but what we did was we changed the uh, curing method to a peroxide cured, and uh, peroxide cured is much more. Uh, it it retains the shape. The EPDM retains the shape, uh, and it's more elastic. So, when uh, where, during application, when the disc rotates, uh, the the, sh the EPDM goes back to its original shape. Because uh, what happens is that uh, imagine like five. 10 years of uh, the disc going back and forth, the, the rubber begins to fade out and it, it, it's gonna get eroded and there's gonna be a lot of leak points that happen. But if it's, if the, with the new uh, peroxide cured EPDM, it's, it's, it's got a memory retention and it's more elastic and that leads to its shape being maintained as it was on day one, which leads, which in turn leads to lesser leak points and lesser leakage. Mahesh, I, I just wanted to review a uh, mini review here that um, the, the the valves, the butterfly valves are more robust and they and last longer and they deliver better value. Uh, but they're ideal, a butterfly valve is ideal for chilled water, hot water, open loop cooling tower applications. And uh, I wanted to revisit what you said about the HIT. Uh, for our viewers out there, we'll have a link onto the site, but uh, Siemens has really 
put together a profound effort. Uh, this HIT is an HVA, HVAC integrated tool. It'll give you selection, replacement, projects, ordering, and then a video, a tutorials with everything. So I, I think what I'm excited about here is that you guys have really stepped forward to educate, to make this uh, information available. And, and, and there's just a great wealth of information, the technical programs, specification resources. You have HVAC webinars, engineering advantage programs, spec writer application, and the product master spec are all tied into this butterfly uh, brochure. So we're gonna have that on the, um, on the post that we have so that uh, our viewers, uh, you know, control trans viewers can access that. But um, the, sure. the biggest problem I think with butterfly valves was delivery. And uh, you know, cause it, the pricing was always good and we always got a good response, but then you'd get this four to six week uh, delivery uh, notification because essentially you were ordering it uh, from the vendor and the vendor was third partying the, the, the butterfly valve and the actuator were being put there. Uh, but one of the cool things you guys have now is free assembly and free tagging. But tell us a little bit more about the delivery. Right now you guys have two to 14 inch immediately available and in, in July you're gonna release your, uh, your larger sizes. But let's go over that again. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so we have uh, we have sizes two inch through fourteen inch. Uh, you know that we started selling to the market. Uh, actually, exactly two months back, it was launched on April thirteenth, and uh, sixteen inch through twenty four inch is, will be offered uh, from July first onwards. Um, and uh, like one of the major major pain points that the customers told us, and one of the primary reasons for frustration was like as you mentioned. Uh, longer lead time so it, it would be like more than like four to six weeks and uh, the, typically like valves are something that uh, that's ordered at the end of the project and uh, if the valves get delayed the whole project gets delayed and then it's it's a huge uh, uh, frustration for everybody involved so we wanted to create uh, or we wanted to solve that issue for our customers and uh, as part of the new Siemens portfolio or the Siemens uh, branded butterfly valves, uh, we are offering a lead time of uh, five business days after receipt of order for most uh, most sizes and for most quantities. So uh, for any reasonable amount of quantities that you have, uh, we offer, we deliver the products uh, directly to the job site within five business days, which would greatly help, uh, help out our customers. And if you have any uh, larger project sized quantities, then uh, our customer service would be able to help out the customer to get an accurate uh, estimate on a lead time. Mahesh, boy, that sounds great. So I'm guessing that you guys plan pretty well for the COVID-19 and your supply chains are for the most part intact if you were able to do that. Yeah, so, so, so far uh, there's been no hit on our uh, supply line, so it's all good. And uh, we have had no backlog, so that's, it's all going strong and good. Yeah, just like a bus. <laughs> well, and, and I want to compliment you again on your 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 seat. Uh, you know, back in the day, we we do a, Stromquist company does a lot of industrial stuff, and back in the day, we used to uh, handle some industrial butterfly valves, and uh, you know, they would be on the pump and paper mills on things called digester blow valves to sort of test mm -hmm. a, is a testament to just how you know really rigorous these valves are. And a digester blow valve for our audience who doesn't know, it's on the big paper maker. They they take all the pulp and stuff and they just steam it up and it builds a lot of pressure up and then they open a, bu a butterfly valve and then it all comes out and then from there it becomes paper, but it's rigorous, rigorous duty. And of course, in the industrial side, it was what kind of seat material do you have and, and what kind of liner do you have? Because those were the two things that could really go. So uh, I, I don't want to gloss over too much about your seat because I, I think the fact that your seat sort of relearns and reshapes itself is a huge piece because that is really the, I mean, if you think about a butterfly valve, that they're pretty simplistic in terms of the mechanics of it. And that really is about the only thing in my estimation that can go wrong, uh, you know, at least in the near term. So if you don't have the seat right, you don't have the butterfly valve right. So again, say more about your, your seat material and what you do with that. Yeah, so, right. So uh, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a simplistic design. I mean, at the end of the day, it is a very simplistic design. and there's uh, two or three things that can go, go wrong. So one is the seat, and then the other thing would, could be disc. So the disc material, um, it's, it's a, something that you need to be careful about uh, while, dis while uh, designing a butterfly valve. And uh, so these two things are what we, our Siemens engineers uh, changed um, to make it a more robust product. So as I mentioned, uh, for the EPDM seat, we changed it from a sulfur cure, which is typically what's available in the market 
to a pair of like your EPDM, and uh, that makes it more uh, uh, temperature. It's it's great for high temperature resistance, uh, and it's great for uh, the the shape of uh, the. It's, it's elastic and it retains the shape, so that's good for uh, preventing leakage. And uh, the other thing on the other side, uh, we change the disk material also. So a lot of our, our competitors offer stainless steel, uh, but what we saw was uh, there was corrosion. Um, butterfly valves are used in uh, chilling uh, applications, so it's open loop and it's uh, water and oxygen. They don't mix well with uh, iron, and that causes a lot of corrosion. And uh, we wanted to have a solution for that. Um, so what we did was uh, we use uh, 316 stainless steel for our disc material. And 316 stainless steel, is uh, it's got molybdenum and it's highly corrosion resistant because of that element in, in it. And it's a premium material and uh, none of the competitors use 316 and Siemens is the only uh, product line out there that uses 316 stainless steel. Um, it, it's great for high temperature resistance and it's great for high corrosion application. Very Mahesh, cool. I had a question with them. Um, well, Kenny, real quick before you, look, is, are you hear my cash breaking up on your end too? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm wondering, it's almost like uh, if you're talking to a microphone, it's almost like the connection is not all the way in. So when you move, it sort of crinkles a little bit. So um, oh, really? or do you have a remote mic or something just breaks up uh, a little bit? And it goes oh, away, okay. so it comes Maybe and goes. I can yeah, I, yeah, it kind of comes, but oh, you know, it, it's intermittent. It doesn't, to Kenny's point, doesn't have, it seems like it happens when you're moving. Okay, so, I'll try but, not to. No, no, you're perfect. Okay, cool. All right. All right, <laughs> hey, Kenny. Kenny I have, well, hey, I, I have, have a very, a, very important cool. question I got, I've been dying to ask you here right, because Kenny, you talk about in. that disc. Yeah, so when you're talking about uh, yeah. the disc, under, undercut and full cut, I'm looking at your brochure. Um, what, what, when do you use the uh, undercut disc and when do you use the full? Is it a matter of pressure? When, when, uh, it's the application? Right, great question. So, um, so full cut disc, we offer full cut and undercut discs. And full cut discs, uh, they offer uh, pressure. I mean, they they see they close off against pressure up to one seventy five psi, and undercut offers uh, close off up to fifty psi. Now, uh, what what uh, what's the difference is that uh, for undercut disc, you you trim off uh, part of the external uh, circumference of the disc. So um, it, there's not too much of an overlap between the disc and the seat material. And so basically you, you are uh, reducing the, the pressure difference that it can block, the, that it can hold against, but you're reducing the torque. So uh, if you, let's say for an eight inch valve, um, our Siemens, um, you need like, let's say a thousand inch pounds of torque to rotate an eight inch full cut uh, butterfly valve. But if you undercut it, you can reduce the torque requirement to maybe like 600 or 500 inch pound. So you can use a lower actuator and uh, get a lower cost basically. Uh, Very for, cool. But you can, yeah, and, but the only uh, trade-off is, is that uh, you're reducing your, uh, your close off from 175 PSI to a 50 PSI. So again, if, if it depends on the application and we do offer full cut and undercut um, depending on the application. Great answer, yeah. Yeah, it's a great answer. Well, listen, for our audience out there, and, and you know, just to get some stable data we might not know, what is the difference between close-off pressure when you're sizing a valve and, uh, you know, the ANSI rating, for example, the pressure the valve can handle? Yeah, so, so close-off is uh, it's, uh, how much uh, valve pressure, I mean, how much fluid pressure the valve can hold against without leaking. So that's the that's the function of uh, what's the overlap between the disc and the seat. So that's an internal uh, that that's based on the design. Right. And f for uh, your ANSI rating, that's the basically like uh, what's the the thickness of the valve. I mean of the flanges and uh, it's how much uh, cold working pressure it can handle. So that's a function of the body. And uh, right. uh, we have like uh, cast iron. Uh, so it's, I think, ASTM A126 cast iron, which can go up to like one or uh, 250 PSI of cold working pressure. But that's, that's not based on uh, the, the, the internals of the disc or internals of the butterfly valve. That's more a function of the, the body and the thickness and the right. flange rate. 
So, so for example, if I have uh, 100, 100 PSI pressure coming into the valve, and then when the valve's closed on the, on the upstream side, I have 100 pounds of pressure coming on the downstream side, I have 80 pounds of pressure. How much close off do I need for my actuator? Oh, I mean, how do I, I not understand that, sorry. Oh, okay, so I've got 100 pounds of pressure coming in, and I can edit this if it, if it doesn't make sense. Yeah, sure. I got sure, 100 yeah. pounds of pressure coming in on the upstream side of my valve, and on the downstream yeah. side of the valve, I've got 80 pounds of pressure, getting back to the design. So am I actually having yeah. to close off against 100 pounds, or am I closing off against 20? Oh, it's, uh, oh I see. Um, so it's, it's differential pressure. So it's, it's going to be 20 PSI that you're going to be closing off against. Yeah, I, see, I, th I think that's a good point. I know when I first got in the industry, I would get confused. And this gets back to vis-a-vis -vis the, the ANSI rating. So in other words, the, the actuator you would need in that scenario, a closed loop system would be you need an actuator to close off against 20 pounds, right? But using the same example, if I had, you know, 280 PSI coming in and, and on my upstream side and on the differential side, it was 260 pounds, it's still a 20 pound close off, but it's 250 pounds of pressure. So, you know, I'd have to have a 250 pound ANSI rated valve to, to handle that, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So okay. the differential pressure or the pressure that you're closing off against, that's differential yeah. But the absolute pressure value, that's that's where you need the bigger body. Or like, right. Uh, yeah, that's true. And uh, yeah, I learned it, this the hard way in the yeah. industry. So. Well, well, it is hard. And I know it was confusing for me, uh, Kenny, and I, I got to tell you, because and I guess the other example would be if I had 100 pounds of coming in and I was not I was not in a closed loop system, I just had a valve that was going to you know dump water into the river or something like that. I had 100 pounds coming in. When I opened it up, it was just a dump. Then I would need an actuator to close off against 100 PSI. Yes, that's But if true. downstream of that valve, I've got 80 PSI. So far, people that, are, that might not know, because this was very confusing for me, your actuator size is in, in a closed loop system is based on the differential pressure. Your ANSI rating that you need for the valve is going to be rate based on the, the, the pressure that, uh, that yeah, uh, yeah, that's coming through pressure. the actual pressure yeah, so yeah. which yeah, which brings so. me to a great topic which is you know because we we've talked about one size of the equation which is the um the valve itself be it a ball valve be it a butterfly valve or whatever but i think what makes you guys really unique is the, the other part of the equation is your actuator right and you guys do all the actuators so speak about the actuators and and you know to me that's a differentiator anytime you can have <clears throat> the same person do your valve body and your actuator I think that's a plus. Yes, yeah. So we are not just uh, a valve uh, provider. We are also a, a truly customs and systems provider. So uh, for the butterfly valves, uh, specifically for the butterfly valves, we offer uh, industrial sized actuators and uh, the commercial, smaller commercial actuators. The industrial actuators, they they can be used for, again, like sizes 2 inch to 24 inch, and uh, they offer torques from 600 inch pound all the way to 41,000 inch pound. So any application that you can think of, we have the industrial actuators for that. And uh, one other thing that we did was uh, a lot of these butterfly valves are used in uh, cooling towers and uh, chiller application. And uh, the, the fluid medium is so cold that there's gonna be condensation. And if the condensation gets inside the actuator that can spoil the actuator. And uh, you have to, there's a lot of downtime and so we not want to do that. So what we did was we have an integrated heater in all our industrial actuators as standard. So this uh, this heater helps to drive off from the And uh, on the other end, uh, the, we have we offer uh, the smaller uh, damper actuators, and those are uh, they range from uh, sizes two inch to six inch. And our damper actuators uh, offer fail safe um, uh, and floating. Uh, option that's really cool i um i, I just um following some of the um uh, information uh, on your website and whatever but in summary it's just uh you know i want to make sure our, our listeners understand that siemens has resolved a lot of the common pain points uh, and really come up with solutions uh they have you know increased and enhanced the features and benefits uh with the butterfly valve and one of them was the smart part numbering system and how it works Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, previously our offering, uh, there was a, the part numbers were very confusing. Uh, they, it started with A7F and then it, it, there was no rhyme or reason. 
to the part numbering system. Uh, it was to be, I mean, I'm the product manager and I was, uh, I had a tough time understanding what it meant, to be honest <laughs> with you. And, uh, but uh, I don't know if you had to cut it, cut it or not, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, for the new Siemens butterfly valves, we created a new uh, part numbering system, which is very intuitive and very, uh, very Great. easy to understand. And we have a separate decoder ring for the the valves. Uh, we have a separate decoder ring for the actuator. And then uh, once you combine both of that, you get uh, the, the the decoder ring for the assembly. And the assembly is just um, a valve followed by a dash and then the actuator. So it's it's very easy to understand uh, and it's intuitive. So if, if there's a two, that means it's a two way. If it's three, it means three way. And then, uh, we have the sizes, so if it's O2, that means it's two inch. If it's 20, it means 20 inch. So it's it's very easy to understand, and you can build your own configuration as you go along. Right, and again, I cherry picked it and I looked at the tool. So it's a it's a we welcome all our listeners to go to the site that we'll have on the uh, post, and on there is a great deal of uh, information. You know, I just seems to do a really good job of consolidating that. And everything you talk about, I've been through. I, nightmarish uh, you know, situations, ordering stuff, figuring out, the, as you said, the decoder ring. That sounds right. It sounds like the Green Lantern decoder ring because, I mean, it was like every once in a while you ordered the wrong dang thing, and you're like, how did I do that? How, how did I miss that? How, how did I miss the spring return? And it was because the, the part number was you know, 12 inches long, you know? And, and yeah, exactly. uh, it, so the phone rang, and you, you came back to it, and you're like, okay, there, you know, and you just – continued on with your mistake but uh really sounds great i, I applaud uh, you know because again uh we always make um the it sounds so easy and sounds so simple but it's not but then when you really get a you know a good product and, and the ability to use it effectively and and it stands up and, and you can sell it well that's a good day for everybody in the business yeah sure. and uh, no, just to just to expand on that um actually the the, the product management and uh, the marketing team we worked a lot we worked really hard uh, so that the customers had an easy experience of selecting and choosing a valve <laughs> yeah well butterfly valves i mean you make a mistake and you get a 24 inch butterfly valve showing up and you got something wrong on it uh, that's not an easy mistake to fix so you know again like kenny says i really applaud you guys for making it simpler and if you guys don't mind we got a few extra minutes and you know and i realize that our audience is very very diverse we have a lot of people that are seasoned valve professionals and you know they've been doing this forever so they they just know all this stuff. And, you know, and as we're having this conversation, I'm assuming that our audience knows everything we're talking about, but I'm also very sensitive to the fact that we have a lot of, you know, younger, maybe newer people to the industry that are listening. So if you guys will indulge me for a couple of seconds, I think let's go through a couple of basics that people might, that the veterans are going to know about and, and some of the newer people, it might be a bit confusing for them because again, you know, when we talk about, you know, the valve, we talk about things like normally open, normally closed, spring return open spring return close let's just let's get real basic for a minute and and as people are going through that selection process what do those terms mean does maybe somebody who's sort of new and, and not 100 percent sure sure so uh let's let's begin with the actuators um so we offer on off and modulating on our industrial actuators so what it means is that uh, on off is uh, you have only two switches so like it's either like no power that means it, it, it goes back to its uh, position. I mean, it, it doesn't, it, it goes, it's in its initial position basically. And then uh, if you put in the full power, that means it goes to the fully open position. And for modulating, it, what it means is that uh, we, it, the control signal is zero to 10 volts DC. So for each uh, step increase in the voltage that you give it, the, the disc or the actuator moves the disc by that equal percentage. So at a 10 volts DC, you have the, the valve that's 90 degrees fully uh, open. And at zero degrees uh, or zero volts, the, the disc is zero percent open. So when you put in a five volts uh, DC, that means that the disc is 50 percent open. Right. So that's, it's a proportional uh, balance. I mean, it's a proportional response to the actuator uh, that, and the power that goes into the actuator. But, but, but when you say equal percentage, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the regular control valves where, where it's not actually a linear relationship. It, it's oh, sort yeah, of curved. Yeah, right. It's more parabolic. So your, your butterfly valves are not linear. They're more of the, uh, when you say equal percentage, you actually mean equal percentage. Sure. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, so what I explaining was about the actuator and the power right. and response uh, for the disc. 
uh, for the valve response, yeah, you typically there's a linear response or uh, there's an equal percentage. So an equal percentage is uh, where uh, it's it looks like your exponential curve uh, in your high school math. Um, and right. uh, basically there's for like zero to 40 percent open, there's very little um, uh, response that the, the valve offers uh, uh, based on how open it is. But then um, for between like 50 to 70 degrees, it, it shoots up. Uh, so that's like your, uh, your exponential curve, uh, the, the middle portion of your exponential curve. And then for 80% to like 90%, it, it flats out again. So that's yeah. what is meant by a equal percentage curve. And, and when you, when you were the, talking earlier about needing to control in that 60% range, that by ordering it that way, as opposed to a linear curve, you're, you're, so you would never probably want to use the, the linear valve profile if you're doing modulation. You'd probably always want to use the equal percentage, correct? Yeah, equal percentage is the, the best uh, option for a modulating uh, application. And the reason is that uh, um, I wish I had a, uh, a screen to show, show you, but uh, the, the system uh, responds differently, uh, completely different um, uh, compared to an equal percentage curve. So uh, for the system response, uh, the first like zero to 40 degrees uh, is when it mostly uh, has the major changes and then it flats out. So basically if you have an equal percentage curve and uh, if you superimpose that with the system response, you get a linear system response. So that's why you use an equal percentage curve or equal percentage uh, control valve for modulating applications. Very cool. And then, um... Is there a normally open, normally closed designation when you order the butterfly valves? Yeah, so we offer, yeah, uh, we do offer normally open and normally closed designation. Um, and it again depends on what your application is. Yeah. Um, so if you want something to fail close, uh, we have that option. Um, and then if you want to uh, have a application, if you have an, an a requirement where you need the butterfly valve disk to fail uh, open, uh, we have that option to. Uh, right. And one thing to note is that uh, our, all our industrial actuators are fail in place, and our, we offer our commercial actuators, uh, that's the GCA series that has uh, spring return. So you can spring return it uh, normally open or spring return it normally closed. So fail in place would be if it failed and you were 50% open, it would just stay there. Is it would just stay there. Yes, that's yeah, right. I got you. Yes, yeah. Okay. And then uh, for industrial actuators, uh, there we have this battery pack option where uh, if the power goes, then the battery takes over and it provides the juice to to rotate the disk to you know a open position or a closed position. Very cool. And of course, you know, to Kenny's point, you guys have done a great job with the training videos on the YouTube, and I think you guys have a webinar coming up too, where you'll be going in more detail through the the valve and everything else, right? Yes, yeah. so we have our public webinar uh, and it's coming up uh, on the 24th, so just nine days from now. It's a Wednesday. I think it's from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, so, uh, we, yeah, we have the public webinar where we'll be talking more about these butterfly valves and uh, I'll be there to answer any questions that you guys have. Cool, and you know what, to Eric's point about the... Um where do you get this great new product line from Siemens? Uh, you also... Uh, came up with a really cool uh, sales and distributor locator. So I just typed in Atlanta, Eric, and Stromquist, boom, right up front. Well, I just typed in United States, and it just <laughs> says uh, Jackson Controls and Stromquist. So do you have any other distributors other than Stromquist and Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 you guys did a great job. I, I, is a Mickey Mantis and, and, uh, and, and team have really put forth a great effort and it's starting to show. I think this is, I call it the softer side of Siemens. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, you know, Siemens always had kind of an industrial, uh, I don't want to say standoffish yeah. thing, but it was, it was a branch or no, nobody. And now we're seeing uh, just, you know, just a real strong interplay. So like Eric said, we, we have issues bringing new, new blood into our industry, new, new intelligent young people somehow look at our industry and say, man, uh, no way I'm going to go into uh you know, programming over here in, in this world or get into robotics or whatever. But we really need a whole lot of energy to get uh, young people to look at, at HVAC and building automation as a really strong, viable career field, you know. And, and, and I think the tools we're using now are more attractive. I think some of the slide rolls and some of the stuff that Eric was talking about where you had, you looked down, it was mush and mud and it was not appealing to 
a young mind that wanted to get in and do something, you know, but now because it's, it's tool friendly and, and it has a lot of the uh, good computer tools, I, I think that that's all part of that subset of, you know, attractiveness to, to the industry. You know, it's not right. dry standoffish stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, we are doing our best to train and educate the industry. And uh, to be honest with you, um, even like two years into, or like even one year into my career, even I was thinking of, oh, I need to get something else to be doing something else, but, <laughs> but then, like, <laughs> but then, uh, like, as I learned more about how these valves work and how the pumps works and how the whole system works and how it actually is providing uh, more value to the customer. I mean, like the customer, as in like the occupant of a building. That's when I really understood the beauty of like how these machines work and how these everything works to, you know, give comfort. And I think that's something that uh, we need to educate. Uh, uh, the young engineers in that like it's not just uh, some pump or valve in the basement where it's all uh, you know uh, it's covered with dust and you know whatnot and it's out of sight out of mind but yeah. yeah but it's it's actually like we should I think we should provide uh, or give them, make them understand like what their effort leads to the customer's happiness and customer's comfort well listen I think I can put it in better perspective than that and a different perspective I should say not yeah, better but sure. which is it's yeah, like you're sure. a cardiologist for the building right I mean if you don't want to have to deal oh, yeah. with people and their hearts I mean it's the same pretty much the same principles right you're pumping stuff through other stuff right and um, and you don't have to deal with people with clog well maybe you do with the clog arteries if you get too much stuff in your pipes but it's but it's all pressure right it's it's cool oh, yeah. if you think of it that way you're a doctor you're a building cardiologist. Yes, yeah, and it's a, it's a, this is a beautiful science. Um, yeah. And I think that's where, uh, I mean, and I, I've gone to career fairs uh, in my previous company and I've, I've taught the new engineers. I mean, we, but I tell them that it's an exciting industry and, uh, you know, I try to teach them the practical aspects of what they're going to be doing and how that affects the, the a person, a real person. So that's how I train. Uh, or I, how I encourage new blood to come into this industry. Cool. Mahesh, tell us more, a little bit more about you. I mean, on the personal side, I mean, when you're not being a building cardiologist, what, 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 do, you, what do you like to do? Oh, I, uh, I'm a car enthusiast. So I don't know if you guys listen to car talk. Uh, I've heard it in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I do. And then uh, uh, my, I've woken up my wife uh, sometimes in the middle of the night because I, I go like, so I'm, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'm up and I'm laughing and she wakes up, my cat wakes up. And so, yeah, that's, I mean, that's uh, when I'm not, yeah, when I'm not uh, doing HVAC, uh, so I do HVAC like, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. And then other than that, I'm mostly car talk. So, <laughs> so what's your, what's your dream car? Josh Feldman, uh, hope you're listening. You gotta, you gotta get him this car. What is your dream car? <laughs> So it's um, so my my father uh, he recently passed away and uh, he uh, a Subaru Legacy and he had it for 19 years and at first I had enough of that car because uh, it was an old Peter car I mean and uh, I used to be embarrassed when my father used to drop me to school because um, I, I would ask him to drop me like two blocks away from the school so that my friends wouldn't see it. <laughs> Uh, but now, I mean, uh, that was a big part of my childhood, and the, the car actually. And, uh, uh, you know, my, my dream car would be a Subaru Legacy and you know, sports version. So, you know, uh, yeah, that's after all this uh, coronavirus thing gets over, I'm going to be buying myself a Subaru. Yeah, those are great cars. My, uh, yeah, are. my fa father-in-law is all about it. He, that's all he drives because they'll last forever, right? And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get, I get, go ahead. I mean, no, so uh, Subaru is the only sedan that offers a four wheel drive. Yeah. So that's, that's the other thing. I mean, I live in Chicago and it's crazy, it's crazy, like with the snow and stuff. So uh, yeah, that's my dream car. Yep. <laughs> cool. Kenny, you still got the Corvette? No, no, I, uh, I'm not a Corvette. I, I'll tell you guys, I, I miss the car passion. Uh, a lot of the uh, people I work with, uh, I was just with uh, Denny Kranz from Miller Electric and he is at a car thing right now. He does his rally. He's got two souped up cars, uh, you know, uh, one's a Nova, some, some enormous engine in it, you know, 600 horsepower or whatever. I was with a guy. Uh, wow. and so all my friends were into it, but I never, I personally never bought into it. You know, I had a good friend at it, a Chevelle uh, 396 SS, a Chevelle SS with a Hearst gear shift. And this guy just loved this car. 
and laying tire. We would just ride around, and just be silly. But uh, no, I never, I never had the car. I, I think I was mechanically challenged, and uh, but I always had the, smart enough to hang out with somebody who did have a good car. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, you were yeah, Kenny, yeah. and, it, and uh, Mahesh, I got to tell you, my favorite car. Well, I have a Tesla, which is awesome. That's that's my yeah, current right. car, but. Uh, but but with the Tesla, you're sort of challenged by where you can charge. So we go to the mountains a yeah. lot, which is it's difficult to make it up and back on one charge. So sure. I think about three years ago, I bought a Toyota uh, Land Cruiser yeah. with 200,000 miles on it for like, I don't know, $6,000. And it is the best vehicle I've ever had. I it, it, fortunately have a, a, a Toyota mechanic lives in the neighborhood. You replace the timing timing chain on it once every hundred thousand miles, and it's bulletproof. It is just, it's ancient, like me and Kenny, but it's bulletproof, and uh, that is just. So I, I have an affinity for older things. I think it happened when I got older. So I have a camera that was is older than me. It's my favorite camera, and uh, anything that's old I, gets a new appreciation for me. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, but you you're not got to worry about this for years. You're gonna get older, and you're gonna want even something older. You watch and well, see. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm getting there. I have my gray hair coming out, and it's like uh, my wife tells it's a salt and pepper look, and I don't know if she did that. Much, but. It's a good look, man. You know, there are a lot of people that will put that in their hair just so they get that salt and pepper look. But then you know, then you got Kenny's got perfect hair, right? Oh, please. but you probably you probably didn't know he's a Ralph Lauren model when he's not doing controls. But yeah, yeah, to talk about that. I, well, you know. I can see <laughs> you guys are uh, you're, you're remarkable, uh, uh, and flattery will get you somewhere, not everywhere. But, uh, any, anyhow, uh, the the thing that uh, again, I, I love this whole conversation. See, because this is a personality side that our our industry lacks. We don't do these kind of you know conversations. It's all about you know you know exact geometry, uh, you know numbers and, and and above or below lines. You know, it, it's a really kind of a you know straight stick industry and the personalities that normally are engineers and, and sales engineers and, and distributors it's all about you know the quick buck and you know you know not showing your hand to anybody and, and you know there's no collaboration and i think this new stuff coming out is really it, it's, it's refreshing to see that we're going through a migration and evolution into new areas we we work with a guy named ken st Clair a lot and he constantly refers to like building uh which is kind of new at, at the, the uh cardiologist for building i hadn't heard that one before Eric, so i got to give you credit i put a little dash by your name so you, you went up one on there but but i mean we, we just need this kind of refreshing you know it just break up the the monotony of a you know of an industry that uh, you know doesn't appeal to a lot of people and it's because we don't do this kind of stuff here and show people real live people and we have conversations and, and other distractions after the hvac eight to ten hours Eric, well, probably, you know what, i i, I, I think well, I, no, I, I, th I think you're right, Kenny, and I think this gets back to Mickey Manis and the marketing team at Siemens really sort of uh, stepping into the new age, if you will. I mean, you know, the website, the social media, the tools, the products, you guys have always had the products, okay, happy with it. But I do have an idea for Mickey Manis that I think you'll like, and let's pitch this idea. So here's the sure. deal. Siemens gets you a Subaru, okay, <laughs> sure. and me and you and Kenny do a road trip across the United States to promote the valves. Kenny and I will film it. And it'll be like one of those adventure series, right? You know, you know, traveling in the Subaru with the Siemens valves. What do you think? You think we could sell that concept? Oh, I would love that. Yep. Yeah, I think yep. so. We could probably get some really good deals on hotel rooms right now with the coronavirus too. So, and, you know, exactly. and what yeah. do you think, Kenny? You in? I'm in. Let's and, do uh, it. All right, let's do it. So, all right, Kenny, anything else before we hop off with our good friend Mahesh here? No, I think we, uh, we covered it all. And again, uh, congratulations on, on uh, effort well done. And uh, we wish you all the success. And, and uh, we both sell semen, so we'll probably uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be bumping into these butterfly valves real soon. Yeah, and look for, yeah. look for the semen Subaru Tour coming to a town near you. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. All right. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot for having me here. It was great. Uh, really great talking to both of you. And thanks a lot for what you have been doing to this industry. Oh, you're welcome. We'll, we'll love to have you come back on sometime. So let's stay in touch. Sure. Okay. All right, cool. Wow, I had no idea butterfly valves could be so interesting. Yep, they are. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. We hope everyone had a wonderful Father's Day. Remember to be bold, be in control, and stay safe. Indeed! <laughs>